<laughs> Thank you, Grant. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm very impressed with all that stuff on the board. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And with, just before I say a few introductory words, it's a pleasure to see some old friends and two very important people who are here this morning, sitting right dead smack in the front centre. Chris Olsen and Sandra Hogan. Would you please stand up? Oh. <laughs> um, okay. You, you have been seen. Uh, Thank you. The reason that Chris and Sandra are important is that they are embarking on writing the story or the history of the JK Centre for publication in 2020 which will be the 50th anniversary, formal 50th anniversary of the JK Centre. So Chris and Sandra have just begun the journey. And their first stop on the journey was to talk to Alvin, you'd be surprised to know. <laughs> so we're delighted, well I'm delighted that you're both here this morning. Uh, okay, I, I really want to do, try to do two things this morning. One is give people a picture of an idea, some background of a man called Julius Crutchnit, whose name is of course synonymous with the centre, because I suspect that there are quite a few people here who don't have much of an idea of Julius Crutchnit. Uh, second thing I want to do is to try to convince you that he deserves the word great or greatness in the title. I thought about that a heck of a lot. What did I, what was it worth, was it appropriate to use that word? Uh, because it's not a word you use lightly. A lot of people do use that word very lightly now. My grandkids would no doubt say awesome. Uh, but, which actually in Crutchton's time as I looked up meant something completely different. Um, absolutely, it meant dread amongst other things, or meant dread. But I want to try to sh tell you, show you that Crutchnik was a great man. I have no doubt he was in my own mind. Uh, I've got an unconventional start. I want to try to put up for you, somebody said you're going to tell all lies this morning. Well, maybe <laughs> some of them are, but there is some substance behind what I'm going to say. And really, there are two, the starting point of my starting point, two books. Well, my starting point really was one, two, three, four, the fifth one down. Well, what would Julius think? Um, I'm ashamed to say that to somebody who lived and spent so much time in the centre, for all those years, I really didn't know a lot about Julius Crutchton. I did meet him once or twice as a student here, but did I know much about his life and times? The answer was no. I don't think anybody at the centre really did except Alvin perhaps, probably, or certainly, whatever you want to pick. But I gave the Julius Crutchnick lecture in Brisbane, which is an OSIMM Southern Queensland branch thing, and that made me go back and look into the life and times of Julius Crutchnick, since that lecture is in his honour. So there are two books, Mines and the Spinifex by Geoffrey Blaney uh, and The Man from Osaka. Uh, Blaney, of course, is the Melbourne historian, often in the news, but he cut his teeth, actually, in his early days in writing histories of Australian mining. And he wrote one on Queens on Mount Lyle, it was called The Peaks of Lyle, it was the rush that never ended. Uh, he wrote the Mines and the Spinifex, he wrote one on Broken Hill, he wrote a famous one called The Rush That Never Ended, and maybe one or two more, I'm not sure. But they are great books. I don't know whether they're in the library. You can find them easily. If you want to get a picture of mining history of Australia, read Blaney. Uh, and the Man from Osako is the story of Julius Crutchnit. It was an OSIMM project a good many years later. They're great sources. I don't know whether the Man from Osako is in the library here. I imagine it should. Certainly hope it is. Uh, Leadville, Colorado's Magic City is a strange one, but we'll see the reason why a bit later. Uh, Copper at the Curry, well, that's a strange one too, but you'll see the reason why a bit later. My own talk, 
Um, when I was preparing the JK lecture, I of course spoke, who knew Julius Kruchnik? This was 2011. I could only think of two people who really knew him well, or knew him. One was Alvin, and you know who he is. Uh, David Buchanan, almost very, very few of you will know who David Buchanan was. David was a metallurgist who worked his entire career with MIM. Um, he joined the company as a very young metallurgist in 1947, which of course when Crutchnick was there. He'll crop up once or twice in the story as well. And of course, Karen Holtham, the treasure you've got at the centre, who is able to find things and help you with things. So, I want you to look now quickly. I'm not going to say to get the first three slides. Just try and take them in. Don't necessarily read what's on the bottom. Get the impression that it creates on you. There's the first one. There's the next one. And there's the third one. Well, Crutchnet, it's a photo, it says 1926 of Crutchnet's eldest daughter in Tucson, Arizona. The impression that creates for me is a young woman with enjoying life and the trappings of life in 19, whenever it was, 1926. I should also say most of these um, slides I've got up here are scans of old slides, so uh, they're not Malcolm Powell quality, but forgive the uh, scans of old things. That's crushed its house in Tucson. Uh, it is now a bed and breakfast. El Presidio, it's called. Uh, it's located right in the centre of Tucson. To my great regret, I visited Tucson many times. I never actually stopped and drove past that house. I wish I had. I was too interested in going to the Pima County Air Museum. Uh, is, anybody who knows Tucson will know that's there. And you've got a spare moment in Tucson. If you're vaguely interested in engineering, go to the uh, Pima County Air Museum. So, that is Mount Isa in the early 30s. And it's said they're working, you can see some housing. The large house bottom centre is the general manager's house. So, the question is why would somebody leave the lifestyle that Crutchnick? and his family clearly enjoyed in Arizona to go to that. And the answer is there. Don't need to say any more. That's the introduction. So, a little bit about the man, and this is merely skimming Julius Crutchman. He was born in 1885. He came from a wealthy family. Clearly it was Germanic, German in background. His father had large stakes in US railroads. So the family had wealth and position and influence. For reasons that are not clear in any of the books that I've been able to read, he chose to study a mining, do a mining related course. He did it at Yale. He finished in 1906. The bit that interested me, of course, was look what he studied. Um, it was a general engineering course of its day. Um, Geology, mining, processing, mineralogy, chemistry, maths, engineering topics, hydraulics, mechanics, and those sorts of things, English and French. Now, you contrast that with what's offered today, and you ask yourself maybe, is it better now than it was in 1906? Um, in one sense, it absolutely is not. We have, an, we have a university which in its brilliance has managed to put 
mining into mechanical engineering and metallurgy into chemical engineering, the only thing you can guarantee that comes out of that is that those students will have zero contact and the courses will have zero overlap. And at a time when the industry is trying desperately to link geology, mining, processing, smelting, etc., etc., you have to think they're a much smarter then than the University of Queensland is now. That's clearly a personal opinion. Chris, that, that's not a lie, that's a fact. Yeah, yeah. The interpretation of it is a personal opinion. <laughs> so anyway, he, he then went, his first job was as a geologist in California, or a geologist assistant. He wasn't there very long. He second job was at the Morency, what is known as the Morency copper mine in Arizona. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably visited Morency over the years. I certainly have. And then he joined the Sarko in 1909. Um, well, what was the Sarko? And there I switched to, and this is where I've got a bit of, strange little bit of personal contact with this. The origin of the Sarko actually goes back to, one of the books I showed you early on was called Leadville, Colorado's Magic City. Indeed, it was a magic city. I, that was my second job. I went to uh, join AMAX or Climax and lived in 1977. The mine was outside this little town called Leadville, Colorado. I don't know how many people have seen Leadville, been through it. A few of you might have. Wonderful, wonderful place, I think. Uh, mining history to burn. It was a silver town, lead silver town in the 18 late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the thing that where one of the area where the mining industry was so different then from now, of course, was that so much of the mining was about digging it up and smelting it. Concentration was a small part of the activity. Um, although Australians will, will say rightly that flotation was around in the early 1900s, and it clearly was. The Americans didn't think it started till about 1912. But flotation wasn't widely used, let's put it like that, anywhere. So smelting, Leadville was full of smelters, dozens of them. This one, uh, it's a photo taken from that book, is the start of the American smelting and refining company. Its first operation was in Leadville, Colorado. The people behind it were the Guggenheims, the famous New York financier. So that's the Sarko start in the early 1900s. Kruchnik joined that company. But that company was very much interested in silver and a lot of its operations were in Mexico. So I think that was the last thing in that previous Yeah, that's right. So here we go. He, he's, he joins the Sarko. He's immediately sent in 1909 to Sarko silver mines in Mexico. Mexico then was a turbulent place. There had been a long, long standing president of Mexico. Revolution was rife. From what you read, the classic South America. Well, Mexico, of course, is not South America. But people have a vision of desperados in South America and the revolution and so on. And that was Mexico. That was the environment which you went into. Uh, one of the things that is he remembered that uh, talked about much in the book was that he was held at gunpoint for a good many hours along with some of his, his mining mates in the Mexican Revolution in 1910. What did he learn from that? He learned all sorts of things apart from the business of geology and mining and recovering all. He learned the business of operating in a difficult environment in foreign country, with a different language, and so on. Uh, that lasted for three years. He was then posted to a smelter, El Paso smelter. Sarko had that smelter for many, many years. It's probably still there, run by Grupo Mexico now, I presume. Um, again, no smelter. So Crutchnik knew about smelters. He knew about geology, he worked with geologists, 
His business in Mexico was mining to some extent. He was just smacking the smelters. And then he goes to Tucson, then he was posted to Tucson office in 1912, which is where he stayed until 1930. Tucson became the centre of a lot of the Sarco operations. And the mines are ones that a lot of people have visited over the years, the Silver Bell being one of them. Uh, and this crutchly ended up as, I don't know what the official title was, head of, head of Asako Southwest Operations, which meant all the Asako operations in Arizona and all the operations in Mexico. By 1930, he's a experienced, <coughs> senior, very successful um, mining Let's call it mining in the overall sense, individual. And then, out of the blue, in 1930, he's appointed as general manager of the Mount Isa Mines. And of course, making that appointment, he's leaving the life and style of Tucson, where the books tell us very clearly that, that Crutchnitz, his wife was a um, Mari and was an elegant, um, highly educated lady who was part of, very much part of the Tucson social <coughs> scene. She came from San Francisco. So, Crutchnitz had, not in had four children, the eldest of whom, Mari, was 22. So, they were heading off to Mount Isa to leave behind <coughs> four children age 22 and down, to go from that life to Mount Isa. So we switch the story briefly to Mount Isa. Oh, that's wonderful. That was a, that's a hard photo to see, but I liked it because it's a discussion for living in speech in Spanish with the president of Mexico in 1924. He was mixing with serious people quite clearly. By this stage, he was fluent in Spanish, um, just builds the notion of a very senior man in the Asako world. Now we switch to Mount Isa. We don't switch to Mount Isa at all. We start off at Tom. Um, if you, long before Mount Isa was ever discovered or thought of, discovered and then thought of, I suppose, there was a massively major mining district centred on John Curry. Now that map happened, don't try and read it, it actually comes from a railway book. It's one I found in Mount Isa a couple of months ago. Um, and that's Copper at the Curry, which is actually a story of the railway system that developed around Con Curry and the mines. So if you put a compass on Con Curry and draw a circle. I've got it. That's 100 kilometres. Uh, a bit further out, um, Cannington lies a bit further down, about 130 kilometres. Um, Lady Loretta up to the northwest. Uh, that is really the northwest Queensland mining province. Uh, if people drew the northwest Queensland mining province now, they put a head thing called Mount Isa and they draw a circle around that. In actual fact, that's wrong. That's the northwest Queensland mining province, which takes in Mount Isa, which you can see about 100k from Point Curry. Um, and as an aside, my good friend and eminent exploration geologist Dan Wood, talking about this thing the other day, said that's where the the minds of the future are. They're still there. He has this view, you just got to look deep. So that was, what. what's the importance of that? The, the Concurry field um, was in the late 1800s through till really um, the First World War, the end, to the end of the First World War, it boomed. <laughs> there were countless mines throughout that area. And there's a bit of importance about that later on. So, it was also important in the Mount Isa story because it was a source of people 
little bit of math, man. I was, uh, John Campbell Mines discovered a lead outcrop in 1923. One of the stunning things of the Mount Isa story is how quickly things happen. You think how long it takes to do anything today. In early 1923, by the late, later that year, gouges were bagging ore and taking it to Duchess to stick on the rail. High grade lead with a lot of silver. The government geologist, his name was St. Smith, visited um, the field or the area in the late 19, not, not late, late 1923, issued a favourable report on this as a mining deposit. Corbold, who was very much behind one the Cloncurry copper mines and in particular the Mount Elliot mine, a mining entrepreneur you might say these days, he becomes involved and Mount Isa Mines was established. Mount Isa Mines the first actually, there were two, there, two Mount Isa Mines. The first Mount Isa Mines was established in Sydney in 1920, January 1924. And one of the critical things was it was all under one lease. So there were a few multiple leases in Mount Isa, in the Mount Isa area in that early period, but they were all combined under one lease under the ownership of Mount Isa Mines and mining development begins in 1924. So a year after the field of the Campbell Miles had stumbled upon the outcrop, they started to develop the mine. Uh, and that's when problems start. However, none one of the other characters who's hugely uh, influential and important in Mount Isa's story is Leslie Burkett, who was a London-based mining financier. And he and his companies put in money in 1927. By this stage, they were full steam ahead to develop a mining operation. Buildings were moved from Kuradala and Selwyn. They are two of the towns that were associated with the Cloncurry Copper District. Uh, the Cloncurry, as I said, the Cloncurry District, the mines collapsed at the end of World War I when the price of copper went from there to nothing. And so the mines basically ceased operation. By 1920 there was virtually nothing left except towns. And as we'll see later, a lot of other here. Um, the government had decided, the government put in a train, the train line from Cloncurry which came from Townsville, was extended to Mount Isaac in 1929. Now, 1929, 1930s, of course, the start of the Great Depression. Um, the mine, the development of the mine, which is proving far, far more difficult than anybody ever imagined, um, is just chewing up money. And it was beyond the capacity of Urquhart and his companies to fund it. Urquhart, who by all accounts must have been a person who could convince, a convincing man when it came to selling an argument, like a lot of mining people have been over the years, convinced his Saigon governor, his son Guggenheim, who was the Asako person way back at the start in Leadville, to put in money into this development in 1930. And with Asako's contribution, came the running of the operation. Not a tonne of ore has been produced at this stage. Krushnik is asked or told or given a, a choice he can't, an offer he can't refuse to go to Mount Isa and kick it off. Krushnik and his wife arrived in November 1930. I put that photo in because part of this mining development which was the mine, the concentrator, a lead smelter, and all of the infrastructure. Um, that's a thing called number one concentrator, as it was being built in 1929. Now, as an aside, number one concentrator has a remarkable attachment. It was a fantastic thing. If anybody could write a book on the history of number one concentrator at Mount Isa, um, it's got a deep attachment to this centre. It's, and I'll mention what that is in a moment. It started off as a concentrator to treat 
lead carbonate at all because that's what they were mining close to surface. That was what it was originally designed to do. It, in its life, treated lead carbonate ore, then separately lead carbonate and lead sulphide ore by the mid 30s. Or come to the, in the 40s, it was converted to a copper concentrator. It produced copper for Australian war effort. In, after the war, it reverted back to a lead zinc concentrator. In the early 50s, it became a joint lead zinc and separate copper concentrator. And it laboured on until 1974 when it was replaced with what, what then known as number four concentrator. At the time, Matt Eyes was quite imaginative. It named, named his concentrators one, two, three, four. Um, and people who knew that concentrator, number one and number four, will forever think of them by those numbers. Why, why is that important to this story of this place? Well, Mount Isa Mines, as everybody here would know, is very much influential in the establishment of this centre. It was this, really there were two sites where Alban and his merry group started their major work. One was at Broken Hill, it's incorporation, the other was at Mount Isa. The Mount I and Mount Isa was far more important in that scheme of things than Broken Hill. Uh, Alban started work on grinding circuits, sampling and so on, in this concentrator. It's a, I put the photo in, it would be impossible to give, show you a shot of what Mount Isa concentrate number one evolved to. It was what you might imagine, something which had added to a bit here, a bit there, a bit somewhere else over the years. So, Rao did his cyclone work at number one concentrate. The first successful simulation, grinding circuit simulations, which as Alvin has said, probably was really the birth of the JK, were done predicting how to rearrange a grinding circuit in that concentrate. Go a little bit further forward, Bill White is now part of the JK. The first grinding control systems in Australia was installed in that concentrator in 67 or 68, something like that. And initially it was an analog computer one. JK's MRC's first digital computer, a PDP-8, was taken there for the first digital control in 1968, the end of 68, I think it was. That's right in the bill? Yeah, I think, we, I think old fellas still remember these things. Um, a number of, uh, some years later, a second, um, the first, constant, uh, first JK computer with a disk. You might think this sounds strange, but a disk was a big thing on a computer. JK acquired a computer with a disk, a hard drive. The thing was about that tall, that wide, and probably stored about 500k of information. Um, it was tested there. Yours truly did spent months there as a student sampling the uh, flotation seat starting in 1968. So, so far, Bill, and then other JK people who've worked there over the years. Bill Johnson did flotation work there. Mal Lees, who was a student of my era, did grinding circuit surveys there. Dynamics, surveys of the dynamic response of the grinding circuit. I remember it well because I helped him carry buckets. Uh, Kumar Kawata did his on-stream analysis development work there, for which he got a PhD. That was done in that concentrator. And other JK people who were there, or who worked there in one form or another, Chris Bailey, who was part of one of the teams which took the computers there. Uh, Peter Wickham, a name that many people won't remember, but a few of the old timers will joined MIM, he worked in that concentrator and so did John O'Shea. The connection between that concentrator and this place is, well, it's remarkable. And the work which probably led Alvin would argue to the establishment of the JK was done there. Moving on, the early years of Mount Isa, absolutely disastrous. That's just a few of the things. Um, 
the mine constantly flooded. This was why they were trying to develop them. Uh, cash, cash, cash. They first produced in 1931 when Crutchnit said it was far too soon to do it. The smelter was a complete failure. The concentrator was a failure. Major flotation problems. They sort of ironed these things out. He tackled strikes. Um, these are some of his things. Some, there was a desperate need for housing in Mount Isaac. There was virtually none. Tackle that. He had to battle and put in place a long term financial position for the company because the financial affairs of this company, with the various tentacles and the loan arrangements and the piecemeal financing which had been done in the early years, was a nightmare. Uh, they achieved their first operating profit in 1937. The other thing that happened, of course, the lead price, just as they came on stream, the lead price had completely crashed since you're now in the middle of the depression. Never mind, they soldiered on, they produced their first profit in 37 and Crutchnick was appointed general manager, of, uh, chairman of Mad Eyes and Mines in 1937. Fast forward to the war years. Um, Pre-war, copper had been discovered through drilling, underground copper. And this strikes me an incredible story. 1942, October 1942, note the date, uh, Australian government instructed Mount Isa to cease lead and zinc production and produce copper for war production for Australia. They built a smelter largely from scavenging the old copper smelters in the Cloncurry region, Puridala, Mount Elliot and so on. They built a smelter and they produced the first copper in April 1943. And of course changed the concentrator over to three sulphide oil. That was probably the easier. I just think that's stunning. What can be done in a location like that using your own resources. Today it would take 12, 18 months to do a feasibility study. There'd be 25 environmental complaints. You know, you just know what would happen. That was what they did. Even more stunning was we've got copper going in April 43. In December 43, the government said oh, the Japanese threat was, of course, diminished by then. We don't want copper from you anymore. Stop producing copper. And Crutchnet essentially said, go to hell to the Australian government. We put all this effort into developing this as a copper operation. We're not, I have no idea how this is financed. The books don't really talk about that. Uh, we're going to keep on producing. And they copper production ceased in 1946 and then resumed in 1952. And of course, has continued ever since, in increasing Now, you know, you think of that. What an achievement by Crutchnet and his team. Uh, that's a shot of the copper smelter at Mount Elliot taken from this book on railways, would you believe? But it shows a substantial operation. And lo and behold, there's a converter, which they took to Mount Isa and refurbished and got it up and running again. So that's where most of the first smelter, copper smelter from Mount Isa actually came from, the old Cloncurry fields. So there was good luck. Cloncurry in its mines did two good turns to remind The first was it provided people who were familiar with mining, uh, had worked in mining operations, because it was really only a 10 year gap from when Cloncurry uh, mining ceased to when Mount Isis tried to kick off. And of course there happened to be equipment here, despite the fact it had been lying idle for a dozen years or more. Let's say something about that says a photograph at a Boxing Day picnic. Look at the dress, will you? A Boxing Day picnic in Mount Isa. 
The man on the left uh, is a fellow called Glenn Gross. The man in the centre is Charlie Hilton, who was in fact Crutchnitz's general manager, and after whom the Hilton mine is named at New Riser. And of course, the man on the right is Julius Crutchnitz himself. Um, well, what transpired such a thing? Um, Crutchnet did many other things. And from the late 30s onwards, he became involved to a large extent through Osako connections with mining operations in New Guinea and in Western Australia, both of which were gold. And these were pre war things. So Crutchnet was clearly. Sarko's man in Australia, he became directors of some of these companies. He understood a lot about New Guinea and also the gold mines in Western Australia. Big Bell, one of them, strangely enough. Then, one of them. Uh, he, along with two or three other people, uh, Ian Morley being one, and um, what was the name of the general manager of Mount Ivy? Uh, Mount Morgan? Uh, Malcolm Newman. Malcolm Newman. Uh, convinced the University of Queensland to establish a mining course and it kicked off in 1950 and then it had metallurgy a few years later. He stepped down as chairman in 1953, he was succeeded by George Fisher. I mentioned him a bit later. He stayed as a member of the Mount Isa Mines Board till 1967. Directorships, continued interest in mining. Uh, said that he became an Australian citizen in. 1965. He never returned to the United States. I've often wondered why. I've asked Alvin, why did he not return to the United States? Alvin doesn't know, really know the answer either. I think that's, but for whatever reason, he chose to stay in Australia. His, a copy of his citizenship um, certificate is in the JK Library. People, some people have probably looked at it. I bet a lot of you have. But have a glance behind her, um, Karen's desk. Uh, he got an honorary doctorate in 1971, and he passed away at the age in his 90th year in 1974. So that's that's the career, if you like. Uh, does that make him a great man? I think it does. He was the sole driver of all of that, if you think of from taking in an absolute disastrous development in 1930, turning it into a highly successful and profitable company in 1953, against all of those obstacles. Uh, what was he like as a, as a man, as a bloke? That, of course, is a, you can only get a little bit of an idea by talking to people and reading. He clearly built and retained a senior group of senior people for many years. And I put, because he, cast, of course, can't do this all himself. What he did was build a team, most of whom came from the United States, but went bit by bit back to, um, to the US. But many years later, he built and retained those people. Now, you can't, you might build a team, you surely can't retain it if he's a dictator, if he's a bastard, if he's a difficult person to work with. People don't put up with that. Um, I, I just recently read a book by Gail Kelly, the former CEO of um, Westpac. And in talking about one of the comments that's made in the book was, somebody said one of her strengths was the ability to form a team and then let them get on and do it. And I suspect that was partly crushed in the past. Charlie Hilton. The man after whom the Hilton mine is named was his general manager from the mid late 30s. He stayed there until Crutchnet retired in 1953. Now, a man like that doesn't stay working as an offsider to Crutchnet if he's not finding it, um, let's say, a, an enjoyable and a satisfying profession. This is another interesting thing of. He lived at Mount Isa working full time. The chairman lived at Mount Isa, and the chairman and George Fisher lived at Mount Isa. And interestingly, those two chairmen were company people. 
There's all this great divide. Of course, the American system largely has a, you'll see, a chairman and chief executive officer. Australia now separates out the CEO generally from the, from the chairman. Well, I'm sure there are pros and cons of both approaches, but uh, in this case, the chairman actually was the boss, and in this case, he lived at Mount Isa. David Buchanan, you mentioned David earlier. David told me, amongst other things, that he, one of the things that impressed him greatly when he first joined Crutchnet, every Saturday, would take his senior people on a tour of the well, either the plant surface operations or underground, religiously, every Saturday. What did that mean? It meant that it meant a lot of things. Crutchnick was on top of things. He was still interested and involved, and his people, senior people, knew that, and so did the men working in the place. Um, David Buchanan is an, was an interesting man. He, I remember him well when I first went to Mount Isa. He was a student. Alvin said to me, David was at that stage the general manager. And Alvin said, you must go and see David Buchanan. So I made an appointment to see Buchanan. It lasted about 30 seconds. I went in. I sort of told him vaguely what I was trying to do, carry buckets and so on. It wasn't very exciting, obviously. Yes. After about 30 seconds, he said, don't let me keep you from your work. <laughs> <laughs> he was also a bloke. Who, and Mount, I learned a lot of things in my first time at Mount Isa, and one of them was I told the fellows at the concentrator I was off to see Buchanan, camera, and they said, oh, he's a tough bastard. <laughs> told a story, I'm absolutely certain it's true. There used to be a, a gate outside that mill, and there was always a man in the gate 24 hours a day. David had the habit of visiting things in the middle of the night. So he came up to the gate house in the middle of the night, and of course the fellow in the gate was asleep. So he got a rocket from Crutchnet, sort of woke himself up and said, gee, I better, better let him know he's on his way. So he phoned the ship foreman's office, this is the gatekeeper, and the phone was picked up and he said, you better watch out, that bastard Buchanan's on, on the prowl. The voice at the other end said, it is that bastard Buchanan. <laughs> he wasn't a soft touch, um, but I got to know him well in later years, and that was one of the things he told me. Ted Davies' story. Ted, name that don't mean anything, I think, to anybody in this room except perhaps Alvin and Bill. Ted was one of the early graduates in mining engineering. But his story was interesting because Ted was working as a miner, totally unqualified miner at Mount Isa in the late 40s. Crutchnet spotted him, thought he had potential, backed him to uh, do finish his schooling and do his uh, course, mining engineering course at the University of Queensland. And Ted graduated 1953. Crutchton was sufficiently interested to spot one person pushing through the system as what would now be called a mature age graduate. Um, George Fisher, who succeeded him. George Fisher was no soft touch either. Uh, reader, he, I met George Fisher once or twice. Alba knew him well, fairly well at least. He was not a soft touch. He was a man who could have basically shut down MIM, Mount Isa, for the great strike when he decided things had got out of hand. Um, a great man, a kindly man, a wonderful bloke, a kindly spirit. That talks about the individual. Nothing there about he was a great engineer. And these come from Alvin. I asked Alvin this. You did say these things, Alvin. Um, and I asked Alvin about what he thought of Crutchnet. He said he was interested in research and technical development. He often spent time here. Company loyalty was paramount in an era when company loyalty was something that mattered. And the last thing I like, great general managers skilled in geology, mining, processing, smelting, and, and finance. The whole thing. Now, there wouldn't be many CEOs these days who could say that. There would be zero who could say that. What's his legacy? Well, undoubtedly, a company which overcame 
tremendous obstacles and went to success. A world-class mining operation which was financially strong, no doubt. And the last bit, a company which is imbued with self-reliance in solving technical problems, uh, had technical ingenuity and the pursuit of technical ex excellence. It had to have its foundation in CrunchNet. There was no, I, Alvin agrees with this, I've seen a lot of operations around the world in my time. In the 60s, what, the 60s, 70s, 80s, without a doubt, Mount MIM was the most technically advanced, lively, um, give it a go company anywhere, not just in Australia. They had this notion that we can do it. It was born sort of, you, as an MIM person, you absorb this notion, we can do it. Didn't mean, as I learned out, that they were the best in everything. When I went to Climax, I soon learned that they weren't the best operators in the world. But in terms of the technical side of it, they were unsurpassed. That started with Crutchnet, and they had to solve problems themselves at Mount Isa in the 30s because there was nobody else to help. Well, I switched briefly to the JK. Because, of course, Crutchnet Names and men are here. Helen and I searched and searched and searched for a photo which did justice to the inside of the pilot plant, and we couldn't find one. Although I'm sure they did exist once. That JK people is where the place started. Old timers will remember that. It sort of does it justice from the outside. If you think that looks pretty crude outside, well, the inside we just matched it. Um, that's where it began. Nothing flash. That was a shot of the mine site. We're actually standing out there. Some of that is where we are now. My point is that Alvin began a bit like Mount Isa with ne next to nothing. He had the idea, he got together the people. They developed something. The facilities were rudimentary. This wonderful setup and the even more flash setup that you've got that exists next door are wonderful things. Always remember, it began in something that looked like that. Similarities to Mount Isa? I believe so. This is a grand opening. It's, a lot of people have seen this photo of the first building, what became stage one, which is unrecognisable now. Uh, and it opened in 1971, and there's the great man talking at the opening. Um, and there is, I think that to his immediate left is the Vice Chancellor, that's probably Zelman Cowan of the day. That's the photo, the famous JK photo that I like very much taken in 1971 or two. It shows, amongst other things, Crutchnet right centre front, standing next to um, Joan Richardson, who we all mightily admired and um, thought highly well of for all sorts of reasons, not only because she was a damn good <laughs> secretary at the time. A very, very, to Crutchnet's immediate right is Ray Whitmore, he was the head of the mining department at the time. And next to Whitmore is a very spruce Alvin Lynch. And Bill Whiteman's there and various others and so am I. Um, there was Crutch and he was a frequent visitor here. The last bit of my talk I want to talk about is how is he remembered? Because a legacy is one thing. How he's remembered is something different. I think they're different things. Uh, recently, we were in Mount Isa, and I came across that photo. Uh, it's in the Mount Isa Visitor Centre, or whatever you call it properly now. Alice, but it's a very impressive setup. There's a photo of the three great men of Mount Isa. Far left, George Fisher. Centre, as it became Sir George Fisher. Centre, Jim Foots, Sir James Foots. Far right, Julius Crutchley. Taken, it's hard to say, but 
my guess is late 60s, somewhere around there. Fisher succeeded um, Julius Krachnik. These men all lived to ripe old ages, they were all chairman of the Mount Isa Mines. Um, Fisher lived till 94. King Foots, 94. Krachnik, 89. It must have been the SO2 and the Xanth date that gave them. <laughs> How are they remembered today? Three great men, not just of the Mount Isa Company, but of Australian mining and world mining. Well, it's interesting. Now, George Fisher is remembered as because the name, the George Fisher Mine, is clearly named after George Fisher. Jim Foots. The only thing I could find in Mount Isa which publicly acknowledged him was a name on the big bridge which is called the Sir James Foots Bridge. There might be more than that, but it's well hidden. Uh, pardon? Not really. But, uh, yeah, there's one that the bridge was a major uh, name ceremony. Yeah. The main, the thing, the university here through the Sir James, Foots eventually being, amongst other things, was the Chancellor of this university. The Sir James Foots building at St. Lucy is named after him. Uh, the university connections were strong. The only thing I could find in their eyes was that, the crutching. There might be more, but I know my mad eyes are reasonably well still. The only thing I could find is an obscure oval, which is called the crutching oval. There's quite a bit on the mine site and on the mine site itself. Yeah, but you can't get into that, right? You can't get into that. You can't drive anywhere on the lease. I tried and failed. Um, so, to the world at large, there's not much. The, the branch, local branch, acknowledges Julius Crutchner with the annual Julius Crutchner lecture. There is a Julius Crutchner, that's an OSI member event. There's a Julius Crutchner Education Fund, which is, supports scholarships to students, also administered by OSI men. Um, that particular one I pulled out that year was given by Grant Thorne, who was one of the students who's through this place. Uh, there's not a lot. The thing that most his recognition of Crutchnick now is this place. JKMRC is the entity which most remembers the great man. That's why this place, one of the reasons the JK Centre is so important. And my final thing about the importance of the JK, nothing to do with Crutchnick, but it's what the JK has done. It annoys the hell out of me, and it happens about every two or three weeks, when I read PhD to bridge university industry gap. And if you read The Australian, which I read, and many other things, you will see that refrain constantly. Well, that gap was bridged, more than bridged, it was just an intimate connection through this place 60, 60 years ago. Over 60, well, no, approaching 1960, no, we say a good 50 years ago. The notion that industry and university should somehow or other, PhDs, should connect. It's perhaps true today in the wider sense, but Alvin Lynch worked out how to do that 50 years ago. Uh, it's one of the things that's in the blood of this place. It should never be lost, the connection between the industry and higher degree students. When I was director of the JK, I used well, it still exists. There was a list of graduates of the JK by year. 
and I still have it up to about the year 2010, something like that. No, 2006. I used to know where the people who graduated, let's call it graduated, through the JK with a master's or a PhD actually went after they finished. It is absolutely, get this is fact, over 75% went and worked in industry. The others, in fact, went and worked occasionally at CSIRO or other universities. And the two or three that I never remembered where they ended up. Over 75, but I was proud of that. I was proud of the fact that graduates went out into the industry where they made impacts. Uh, Crutchnet would think that was a great and wonderful thing. So the, the, what told you a bit about Crutchnet, hope I've convinced you he's a great man. The message I want to leave you with is the importance of this place and its unique connection with industry and the supply of people who will hopefully go out and work in the industry. The industry gobbled these people up X years ago. I know things have changed. There's no reason why they won't do it again. So my time is up by a bit more than it should be, but thank you for listening.